Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 117 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another long form interview episode where we kidnap unsuspecting spirits and cocktail experts and ply them with truth serum until they spill all the best kept secrets in the industry. This time around, we catch up with my friend Dan Marlowe, who is a really talented bartender currently heading up the brand new tavern program at Blue Dyer Distilling Company in Waldorf, Maryland. Dan is an extremely passionate student of cocktail history and a really precise libationary practitioner behind the stick. So I'm really excited to share this interview with you. But first, let's do what we always do and give you this opportunity to make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the legendary Martinez, which is one of the early Manhattan spin-offs or martini precursors, however you choose to look at it. In association with this episode, we'll be publishing a video on our YouTube channel where Dan walks us through his favorite Martinez riff, the Missing Link Cocktail, which is kind of an appropriate name for this, as we'll find out in a moment. So head over to the show notes page or subscribe to our YouTube channel to check out that video. Now, as I was mentioning a moment ago, to say the history of the Martinez cocktail is a bit hazy would be generous. It crops up in a number of likely apocryphal texts during the mid to late 1800s, but none of the sources we have are even close to being reliable. So suffice it to say, after the Manhattan came along, people were pretty keen to start combining spirits and vermouth in various ways and using little bar tricks to kind of spruce things up and differentiate the drinks they created from the other contemporaries. Eventually, this would lead to the dry martini down the road, but along the way, the Martinez was born. To make this drink, you'll need two ounces of sweet vermouth. I like to go French here and use Dolan, one ounce of Old Tom gin, and I think a nice barrel-aged gin works just great. You're gonna find more barrel-aged gins than things that have the name Old Tom on them, so normally in a regular spirits market, that's what you're gonna find. One bar spoon of maraschino liqueur, and several dashes of aromatic bitters. We, of course, use our embitterment aromatic bitters, which you can pick up over at modernbarcart.com. Combine all these ingredients in a mixing glass with ice, stir for 15 to 20 seconds until it's well chilled and diluted, and strain into a stemmed cocktail glass. The classic recipe for this cocktail, found in the book Imbibe by David Wondrich, calls for a quarter of a slice of lemon as a garnish, which to me would mean you take a lemon wheel, you cut it into four quarters, and you drop one of those quarters into the glass before serving. Now, a couple things to note about this. Back in the day, glassware tended to be a bit smaller than it is these days, so if this garnish strikes you as a bit puny, well, in a smaller glass, it would seem more substantial. Also, keep in mind, citrus was much harder to get when this drink was invented, so it paid to be frugal with your lemons. As an update to the traditional garnish, I'd recommend a nice expressed lemon twist because I think it's the most perfect garnish for many stirred drinks. But depending on your druthers, feel free to riff and experiment just like Dan does in the Missing Link cocktail video using ugly rum cherries. I'll let you check that out for yourself. So now that you've got a drink in hand, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this spirited conversation with barkeep Dan Marlowe, some of the topics we discuss include how Dan worked his way through the bartending ranks to take the helm at the brand new tavern program at the Blue Dyer Distillery, why a barkeep is a bit different than a bartender, the merits of a fancy handcrafted rum and coke, and when it's appropriate to call it a Cuba Libre, 
how Dan thinks about things like hospitality and how he's developed his personal brand of cocktails and bartending, what to bring along when you're grabbing drinks with Theodore Roosevelt, and much, much more. As we chat, Dan also takes me through a tasting of some of Blue Dyer's awesome spirits, including several rums, a barrel-aged gin, and a port cask-finished whiskey. Whoa. So if you're in the Mid-Atlantic and you have the chance to visit the distillery yourself, please do so. It's a great space run by great people. And with that, let's jump right into this boozy yet well-balanced conversation with my friend, Barkeep Dan Marlowe. Dan, thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah, Eric, absolutely. Thank you for uh, coming down. That was a bit of a drive, but uh, you, you timed it well because sometimes, sometimes it's uh, two hours, sometimes it's forty-five minutes. And yeah, you... well, you know, I have I have a rule uh, with DC. I don't drive like between the hours of like seven thirty a.m. and ten a.m. and I don't drive between the hours of like three and six p.m. And you know, it's a good rule to follow until you have somewhere you have to be. Right. Yeah. And yeah. you're like, okay, uh, let's get some <laughs> podcasts pulled up. <laughs> so can you just introduce yourself to our listeners and uh, give us a brief bio of who you are and, and what you're all about? Yeah, absolutely. First um, of all, wait, cheers. Yeah. Cheers to this. Cheers to you and your bio. Okay. Mm. Ah, delicious. We'll talk about this in a minute. Yeah, of course. I'm Dan Marlowe. Um, some of you uh, may actually know me as Fractions of Zero on Instagram, and that is a moniker. Um, it's also uh, a little bit of a social commentary, but for me, my moniker is an aspect of my personality. It's not a business per se, um, and beyond that, I'm a barkeep, uh, I'm a dog dad, and I'm a soccer referee. More than that, you have to get to know me to find out. So nice. Yes, your dog is awesome. He's been he's been. Uh I I loved meeting him in the parking lot the other day. (laughs) He was uh, very friendly, and I'm I'm a a big dog guy. He's like a big dog, you know? I've got nothing against the little dogs, but I I don't seek them out, you know? One one falls in my lap, I'll love them, but yeah, 45 pounds and up. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So um, tell us how you got into the bar game itself. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways to tell this story. Uh, It's kind of like, I was blank, but then blank, and now blank and we all have that story for me uh, I've been service industry most of my life um, you know I've done some retail I've done manual labor um, and then I've uh, also done a lot of soccer officiating which is a very unique industry to be in but most importantly I decided at a certain point that I wanted to bartend I've been a front of house back of house I've done a little bit of everything <laughs> fast food sit down you know uh, and you, you get to a certain point where you just decide there's nothing left for you but jumping behind the bar And so you learn how to do it one way or the other, and then you do it. And so for me, I was a bartender and it was a skill set, and it was something I could travel with and use, but it was just that I was just a bartender and nothing more. Um, and something happened, some, some things happened. Um, we all go through stuff in life that either motivates us or, uh, discourages us, um, or sets us on different paths. And part of what happened, we'll we'll highlight on the good stuff that happened because the, the bad stuff's not, not podcast material. My boss asked me one day to stop making smoked cocktails because that's all we were doing was making smoked cocktails, smoking this, smoking that. And so he said, do me a favor, go make something new, something different. And the only rule I have for you is that it can't be smoked. So I did some research. I did some reading. I, I, I kind of like for my first time jumping on in vibe and, you know, like yep. um, I found somewhere, I found a recipe for a maple gin flip. Wow. And I had to do it. I just had to. So I went and I got the ingredients. I got permission from my boss to get the ingredients. It was the first time I'd ever done it. You know, the idea of using a whole egg, like I wasn't squeamish to it because I love bl- bloody steaks and raw eggs. You know, like this, this is not going to bother me at all, but I hadn't heard of it. So I tried it. I made it. I think I think I used Baltimore Spirits Company Shot Tower Gin. Yeah. Um, and then organic, pure Vermont maple syrup and whole cream and a whole egg. I didn't know about the use of beer back then, and this particular recipe didn't call for the, the dark beer. Yep. Um, but I made it, did some ground nutmeg on top, and the whole uh, uh, kitchen staff, because it was late at night, the whole kitchen staff and, and, and the two bar staff that were still there, we all tried it, and our minds were blown. It was delicious. And yeah. from that day forward, I have not looked backwards, not only in regard to the culinary aspect of cocktails themselves, but 
from flips as well. And uh, it's, a, it's a love that I've come to uh, find in common with a few other uh, friends and associates, um, one of whom, one of the owners of Blue Dyer is a huge fan of flips and the history thereof. So that is what got the ball rolling. And now we go to the and now blank. Um, I'm what I like to consider a barkeep. And for me, it's a personal differentiation between a bartender and a barkeep. Um, you know, we've sometimes used the words bar chef, mixologist, that, and different people throughout history have, recent history, have coined those terms for a bartender. Um, I like barkeep, and to me, I grew up gardening. So if you tend a garden, you probably just show up, weed, weed it, go home. If you keep a garden, you set it up, you plant everything, you weed it, you harvest it, you you build the fences, you scare off you know the, the predators, you take pride in what you do and you're there from beginning to end. So I see the difference between the two as a similar aspect. You know, if you're tending a bar, you're coming in, you're bartending and you're going home. If you're keeping the bar, there's a little bit more pride and a little bit more overall involvement. Um, so you know, I got some buddies who tease me for calling myself a barkeep, but I'm sure Dale DeGroff had plenty of folks who teased him for calling himself a mixologist. So. That is probably very true. I love flips. They're, you know, for people who've never had one, it's it's one of those like mind blowing moments because when you throw alcohol into a mix with with cream or dairy of any type and then like a whole egg, you've just got this like crazy gradient of fats, proteins, uh, and then like weird flavor compounds. Like, and you're talking about using a gin, there's botanicals in there. Yeah. So it's like, can, like it, it's just, it's just not done. <laughs> and, a high, and a high proof alcohol is going to inherently start breaking down fats and proteins too. So like the, the drink itself shouldn't work, but it does. And obviously there's different histories of it and it started with different ingredients and very specific ones and for very specific reasons. But ever since we've, it's now become a very classy drink served up in a martini glass. Um, you know, it's, it started in a fricking tanker, yeah, exactly. you know, with, with some stale beer and some rum. And, and the, then you put a, f a hot ass burning tong into yep, it the so that you could curdle it and make yeah. sure everything was, was dead and mixed. Like, because you're getting the milk from the, the goat or the cow on the ship. And, you know, yeah. uh, you were lucky to have the egg, but it was you know, your one egg is your ration. You got your rum ration, and then there's some stale beer. Like, they, they just threw it all together. And, you know, there's different histories to it. And, and some, you know, obviously, like any other spirit-related history, there's disputes on the history. But sure. um, what it comes down to is we have history to follow and to learn from. But, like, all of these cocktails... Um, like music there's no right there's no wrong there's history but but they're not uh, how do I put this uh, they don't they don't stand apart from each other right so yeah and it's not a straight line was it uh, you know I think Mark Twain said this and he's quoted as saying I think every thing <laughs> that's ever been yeah, said yeah. so this might be apocryphal but I don't think it is because this actually sounds true to him he's like history doesn't repeat itself but it echoes mm -hmm. right okay so that was Twain you got that one yeah, and and so I, you know, the, I see a lot of that happening in in the bar industry, right? It's like there's, you know, depending on where you are and who you're with, chances are, the whatever fascination is in vogue at that time in either the city or whatever whatever size of zeitgeist you might be you know, examining at the moment. There's there's probably something that was popular like far back beyond memory and we're kind of digging this stuff up and resurrecting. I mean, it's kind of what we do as bartenders. We work with spirits. Of course. And sometimes those are the spirits in the bottles and sometimes it's the spirits of the, the drunk ancestors before us. What's interesting is in the age that we're in with the record keeping abilities we have now, it's, it's almost impossible to forget what's been done. You can be naive to it. But if you actually look it up, it's usually there. And so it's really interesting because for hundreds, if not thousands of years of our history, it was, if you didn't hear it from the village elder or your friend or the historian or in right. school, like you just, you weren't going to know and you couldn't know. Um, so it's a, it's a very different world for that. But 
Should we talk about uh, what we're sipping on? Yeah, I would like to do that. So we're, we're, we found out that we had uh, a common uh, media <laughs> fascination, I call it fascination, fan hit, fanhood. Uh, we both are into the trailer park boys. <laughs> well, who's not, who's not a fan of watching Jim Leahy make a fool of himself? Because here's the thing. The liquor talks to all of us. <laughs> it's just a matter of whether you listen. That's right. So, uh, cheers uh, to that. Cheer, now, cheers, Bobandi. Now, uh, rum, and, rum and Coke being Julian's drink of choice that never leaves his hand. Right. So I'll give the 15-second uh, the Cliff Notes version of this show. It's a, it's a show, is it, uh, is it Nova Scotia? Yeah. I believe it's set in Nova Scotia. And uh, it started like back in like the early 2000s, right? At, Maybe even at, late I think 90s. It, I think it was 2000s, but yeah, it was kind of a cult show that was meant to almost be a joke. And like many cult shows... Blew up. I, imagine was, uh, what is it? Uh, Reno nine one one. Yes, kind of. It, it's it's shot in a similarly boondogglish kind of way where there's a camera crew they're following people around. Imagine the office, <laughs> but then sometimes they get in a fight and the camera guy gets knocked out or the camera guy an, gets an shot. An R rated office in a trailer park with a whole lot of hash and alcohol and illegal firearms. Yes. Yeah. And so. You know, at least for the first couple seasons, the the kind of joke, the the season arc was at the beginning of the season they get out of jail for the last thing that they did, and then the season arc is following them through a new set of hijinks, and it's a uh, very vulgar, it's very silly humor, and uh, you know, like getting mountain getting mountain lions high on weed, stuff like that. It's very very silly, but it it, it also like the first. I will say this: the first couple times I watched it, I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever seen. But then you couldn't stop. Well, my, my, my roommates were also watching it at the time. So right. I was like, all right, fine. I'll, I'll put up with it. But then very quickly, I, I descended into it. And, and the character development is just top notch. Oh, it's brilliant. And I don't think they, and the best part is I don't think they planned it that way. It just, they, something happened and they got more viewership than they ever could have expected. Right. And so then they suddenly said, well, now we can develop characters. Um, but the best part is that because they're all Canadian, everything that happens, even all the gun shooting, you know, the, all the shootouts are, are all very polite. Nobody ever actually dies. All, usually people end up getting shot in the, the buttocks or similar areas. And yep. uh, it, yeah, it's, it's a Canadian spin from the, from the mindset of Canadians are so nice, which is not always true. But right. they strive to be. Yeah, it's brilliant. And and again, so the one of the one of the main four characters, Julian, always carries around these rum and coke to the point where like even during said gunfights, he's he like sitting there. Put down his he, rum and coke. He, he won't put it down. He's like, oh like he'll go back into a burning building for his half glass of rum and coke. Yeah. He he's refused to walk into certain buildings and establishments because they wouldn't let him in with his rum and coke. Uh, it's but so, so what did you, what did you build in this? Because it's, this is not just like, you know, fountain, fountain cola. So what did you, what did you do this? It's, um, it's really delicious. So I, I want to say this is simple because it really is. But I guess for somebody who's thinking of cracking, you know, some Captain Morgan and, and a Coca-Cola can and just pouring it in that, that is simpler. Um, that's going to be full of a lot of corn syrup and, you know, maybe, maybe works, but in the long run, isn't quite as healthy for you because there is a way to drink alcohol healthily. Is that a word? In a healthy manner? In Uh, in good health. In good health. There we go. Um, So for us, all for as an example here in Blue Dyer Tavern, all of our colas, I'm sorry, our sodas from a traditional soda sense, not a um, soda water, um, but from a a sweetened soda mindset, um, are made with syrups that are cane sugar based. And so so it's a a Mexican Coke. Um, And we have Mexican ginger ale, Mexican lemon lime, et cetera, et cetera. And we are actually transitioning over to our own syrups because they're easy enough to make. We make uh, right now a butterfly pea syrup, a cherry syrup, and of course um, a complex simple syrup uh, for the bar program. So making ginger syrup and ginger ale and lemon lime and cola and all the rest are, are coming for the sodas. But nevertheless, it's a cane sugar instead of corn sugar. And then dark rum which we talked about earlier, we got to try some of, um, and it's a barrel-aged gold rum that is essentially darkened through the use of caramelized sugar, but in such proportions that it's not sweetened and it's not considered spiced either, um, but it brings back that funk of molasses. Now, instead of just rum and coke, there's a little backstory on this. Uh, our owner and master distiller, Ryan Vierheller, uh, he likes to drink rum and coke. Now, he also likes to sip rye whiskey by itself, but Typically, uh, around the property, after a day of production, he'll go ahead and pour himself a dark rum and coke. And 
for a while, when I was down here consulting, I would spike, he, I, would, he, I would make his drink for him, and I would spike his drink with about half an ounce to an ounce of passion fruit juice, just really to see if he would notice. And uh, about three weeks later, I was not here, I was elsewhere, and, and he was forced to make a drink for himself. And he called me and he said, this doesn't taste right. I, <laughs> what have you been doing for the last three weeks to my rum and cokes? And I told him I've been spiking it with passion fruit juice. So he couldn't go back to drinking it the same way and he started building them with the passion fruit to the point where when we redid our menu, we have, um, we have a rum and coke on our menu because he, there's nothing wrong with it, and right. it's, it's good quality products. Um, but it's actually on the menu because it's quality products versus anywhere else you just assume you can order rum and coke, but it's not gonna be printed on a menu. Um, and then we have variants of it like a Cuba Libre and a tropical rum and coke, which is our nice way of, of uh, t you know touching up Ryan's rum and coke with passion fruit dropped in because Dan was messing with him. But it, it blends well, you know, the passion fruit has a bit of a bitter quality. Yeah. Um, we treat it with a little bit of cane sugar and water when we get it so that it, it's a little more palatable to the average consumer. Right. Um, but the bitterness of it actually balances really well um, with the molasses in the rum and the not quite molasses, but similar uh, complexity of a cola syrup. Sure. Um, whereas otherwise it's just a heavy drink. It's just dark rum and cola. The passion fruit lightens it a little bit, but it it's does. not. But it's not a citrus, so it's not gonna. It's not t putting a bite in. If we put some lemon or some lime in here, very, very different drink. Yeah, huge, um, huge difference. And and not bad at all. I mean, hence the Cuba Libre. But you know, which is always always tickles me when somebody orders a Cuba Libre. I love making them. I have no problem with it. But it's just like in a traditional restaurant when somebody and it's not on the menu, you're just like, oh, you rum and coke with some lime. Yeah, I can do that. It's not a yeah. problem. Would you like to order a Cape Codder while you're at it? <laughs> um, but Wait, what's the Cape Codder? Oh, no. I'm from Massachusetts. I still don't oh, know. Oh, no. It's is a that... vodka crayon. A vodka. Oh, because of the cranberry bogs. Yeah. But vodka crayon is, the Cape Codder is the, the official technical name for the cocktail vodka cranberry. Not a cosmopolitan, but just a vodka crayon is a technically called a Cape Codder, and if anyone ever orders it that way, you have permission to throw the drink in their face because yeah. who calls it a Cape Codder? But that's how it, that's, yeah. It's also way less appetizing than a vodka Vodka cran. cran. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. Can I just get the, can, if, listen, folks, if there are less than three ingredients in a drink, just call it what just, it is. Just call it what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm okay with the Cuba Libre though. Like if it's, if it's, you know what, like if somebody takes care of the citrus, like if I, like yeah. if somebody takes care of the citrus, if, well, you, you know, know, it's funny that we were talking about it because I, I've started cutting my limes for the Cuba Libre, um, the Cachaça Caprina style where you, I know, you, you read that article because of you. That's why I brought yeah. it up. So, and one of our, so one of our production assistant distillers, um, is actually Brazilian. And so we've been discussing it very recently as well. And when that, article came out, we, we played around with it because I realized this whole time, I've been making caipirinhas correctly to the extent that the ingredients were correct, uh -huh. but I was not doing anything special with my limes, had never heard that or been introduced to it, and this is how we learn. And I haven't, it's been what, like three weeks? I haven't, almost, something like that? Yeah. I haven't gone back from cutting them that way uh, when I do a Cuba Libre. Um, and we actually did a cachaça riff with gold rum the other day just because we have nothing it's else, hand, but, right. but, but the, my Brazilian, uh, 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 distilling assistant drank it and approved. So, and he's very adamant about his cachaças and everything. So, yeah. but, he, but he also knew it wasn't the cachaça when he was drinking. We did, we digress, but. Well, you know, what I like about this and I'm, I'm happy to go on this tangent because this article that we're talking about is actually the Plato and Aristotle walk into a bar mm -hmm. article, which you can listen to um, on the podcast. It's episode, I believe, 115 or 114. Uh, I kind of did like a little breakdown of it. Now, it's not for everybody. This is kind of like a deep reading, kind of like you, heady commentary on it. You but, had an NPR vibe going on that one. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, sometimes I just, I like to shake up the format a little bit, keeps things interesting. But um, what's cool about this and what I like is actually having people who I can talk with like in our community because I'm, I'm not a bartender and I don't do professional development in the same way that bartenders do it in that like if you're a bartender you have occasion to be around in many cases other bartenders and you're kind of constantly just soaking up like the way other people do things and you get to ask questions and you get to especially if you're a member of various guilds like like you are you get you get these awesome professional development 
opportunities, but I don't really have a ton of that built into my life. So I have to kind of like look for it and find people around me who will point me in the direction of these resources. And so that's why I like being able to, you know, like hit you up on, on social and be like, Hey, did you read this article? This is like the best fucking thing I've read in like a year. And it was great. Right. No, it was that approach kind of spun me a little bit too, just because I, I have my own mindset towards my approach, but then to take it back. Cause I, so you, for background on me, um, I started life as a photojournalism major at RIT. And I actually, about halfway through, decided that deadlines on journalism assignments were not really something that I was keen on. I liked the photography, um, but I moved on and I uh, actually switched to anthropology. So when it comes to philosophy, sociology, you know, any kind of analytics of culture, that's right up my alley. And my father was a history major and a big history nut. So growing up, I was already just influenced that direction. So to have to reapproach my own mindset towards these things that I was so confident in, in right. just from reading that article, but it also took me back to all these philosophy classes and sociology classes and, you know, where these discussions occurred in a classroom setting between young pontificating idiots because we were we were 19 20 21 like just trying to hear ourselves talk and hope the teacher gave us a good grade but it really made me think and it kind of left me a little bit confused because i'm also writing staff training programs right now yeah and you know now i gotta kind of reevaluate how i'm designing these staff training programs like it, it am i teaching them the right way and i think i am i think i'm teaching them the way i, w I want to for the program they're walking into but is it going right. to be a good training foundation for the, the overall industry when they eventually move on. Totally. Um, is, is it going to be a, a mono tool or a multi tool? Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. So Fab, we, we don't need to dive deep into it here, but uh, let it suffice to say, like, check out the article, check out our episode on that article. I think it's probably one of the best things that's been written in the past year or so on, on spirits and cocktails. Um, but speaking of your style, so you're mentioning earlier, you're like, you were working in a bar where you were smoking everything and then then you had to you know then you found the flip but like what is your style like if you had to describe your style as a bartender or like your style of service maybe or hospitality what what does that look like yeah absolutely um so i gave this some thought because you know you're you're phenomenal what you do eric so you sent these questions in advance and had a little bit of time to to quote unquote study for the test but for my style of drinks for my personal preference on what I like to make for myself and, and try to impart on other people is definitely the, uh, more of a maple earth, you know, uh, I want to say like robust, uh, malty kind of angle or perspective. Those are the kind of spirits and mixers that I like. Um, it took me a long time to get into, we discussed earlier, uh, gins, be them dry or botanical. It took me a long time and only recently to get into a Amari, you know, diff different uh, things that appeal to other groups of people, not necessarily always my cup of tea, but I'm getting better at being well-rounded, which of course is the goal of any self-growth. And then talking about my actual style of bartending, um, you know, I, uh, <coughs> we may talk about this later. Um, my first bartending competition, I managed to <coughs> spin my shaker, um, drop it. The and classic little and, move. And, and was rebuilding the drink before the, the, the shaker had finished hitting the floor and got all three of my builds in under the seven minute wire um, and was very happy with that and, and got far more points for the recovery than I ever did for if I had a smooth performance to begin with. And we, sure. all, we all had a laugh. You know, I splashed the judges and made a comment about uh, SeaWorld splash zone, you know, like this. But I was being myself. That's who I would be behind the bar in any of my previous sure. establishments. So to get that comfort in a freaking competition where we're all shaking and nervous, and, and I was. The funny thing is, when I dropped the shaker, I actually lost the nerves. Like at that yeah. point, I was just back to regular, like, oh, all right, like now I'm in my flow, like now I gotta recover. Um, and the nervousness was actually gone. But I do, I like to spin my shakers. And I have no issue with it in concept, so long as you don't do what I did and do it, drop it in the middle of a competition. Sure. But, um, from that angle, I like the idea of finesse over flair. So I have no problem sure. with flair bartending, but I think that flair should be functional, and I think that your use of showmanship should not only be part of your 
tools and your tool usage, but your body language, the way that you maneuver in the bar itself and the way that you actually then serve your drink. Um, so my mindset has always been finesse over flair. If I spin my shakers, it's one spin, crack and pour so that if you were having a conversation with your guest, your, your friend, you are now gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna turn at just the right time because your peripheral probably caught that spin. Sure. And now you're gonna get to see the presentation of the drink as it's poured. I didn't have to interrupt you by saying, ladies, watch this. You know, it, it's just a matter of presentation. Um, yep. When it comes to the actual inherent nature of what I'm doing, because we talked about flavor profiles, we talked about showmanship and performance style. I like to approach it from the history. And this is something that I bonded with uh, Professor Spector over, and we were talking about her earlier. Um, but ever since I've kind of come into the fold of culinary bartending, I look at it from a story. And we've, I think we've talked about this too. Um, there's a story behind all of these drinks, and uh, it's inherent that we don't forget the story. Because here's the truth, man, this is poison. Yeah, this is poison in a cup. It's a mild poison. It's delicious it's one poison. One we can usually survive, and it we've grown to appreciate the deliciousness of it. We've we've cultivated it to be delicious, although it didn't always start that way. Right. But the story is about how it was made. It's about the bartender. It's about the bar itself. It's about um, a town's history or a nation's history. It doesn't matter. But without that story, there's no culture behind this drink. It's just poison. And so when I approach new guests regular guests, uh, people who like gin, people who don't like gin. We're approaching it from what is the story that they are going to be interested in or that they can actually uh, give input on. And so I might not tell the same story or focus on the same story, even though it's the same drink, with different guests because one guest may have already known everything there is to know about gin, so we're going to talk a different story about the gin drink they're drinking. But the other guests, they've never even had gin. Sure. So now we've got a different story to focus on. And for me, those are kind of the three facets of, of how and why I'm doing what I'm doing. And the rest of it I just make up as I go, Eric. Yeah, no, we, we all do. Yeah. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a bit of an improv background, so I get it. I, I like that. And the, 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 the other thing I was thinking of as you were describing like the, the functionality of the, the little flourishes or not even flare, but just yeah. like a little, a little flourish that you'll throw in here and there. Sometimes like, you know, if I'm making a drink, usually I'm not behind a bar that I've like set up like just the way I want it. And so like, it's always like a little ad hoc. I'm like, all right, where's the next thing I need? Right. Sometimes when I pick up a bottle by the neck and, and go and then grab it, that like little yeah. second gives me just enough time to think about the next move I need to exactly, make. Exactly, and yeah. it's like that little like professional pause. stall, professional stalling. Yep, yep, exactly. So yeah, it, it all makes sense. I, I really like the the approach, and and uh, I like to watch you behind behind the bar. You're really good, you know, with with your your hands and and just like the way that you present a drink is really beautiful. And and we'll have some some great video in association with this episode to kind of highlight that. Uh, but the other thing I want to highlight is the fact that we are here at <laughs> Blue Dyer Distilling Company. And I, I was hoping what we could do is, you know, because we don't already have enough glasses on the table here, but we'll, let's crowd things a little bit more and, um, and taste through some of their spirits. And maybe as you do that, um, talk a little bit about uh, how you came to uh, be heading up the, the, the bar program here. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to pour out a little bit of gold rum um, and the reason we're going to start with this is, this is the first spirit that uh, was distilled here. Um, there's actually a little bit of family history to it, but uh, it's also the first one for that reason that we started in our tasting flights with new folks. Um, but the, the, the history on this, summarized heavily because we're on a, on a podcast timeline, is essentially that uh, our distiller has heritage of distilling in his family going back most recently to the 1940s and 50s. And right. it turns out... Got grandpa's still right there. Oh, yeah. And that was a functioning still in the uh, 40s and 50s and theoretically could still function today, but the FDA says there's too much lead in it. Um, <laughs> didn't seem to bother anybody back then. Now, there's some irony, of course, to that statement because if you know anything about distillation, lead is too heavy to travel through, so it actually would not come out in the final product, but... Still scary stuff, so. Yeah. Um, now, 
Uh, this is a gold rum. Um, it's gold because it's barrel aged and it's barrel aged in charred barrels. Um, it was actually sold as sweet whiskey by uh, the gentleman who made it, who is Ryan's grandfather. And there's, you know, there's some, some reasons behind that. Basically, in the 40s, if you sold rum, people gave you a cross-eyed look. So right. sweet whiskey sold much better in, in Virginia in the 1940s. But um, here's the thing. We know that neutral grain spirit can go many different directions. It can become vodka, it can become gin, it can become whiskey. So who's to say that neutral cane spirit can't become cane vodka or cane gin or cane whiskey, sweet whiskey? Right. Technically the TTB because they say it has to be made with grain. But you know these are all semantics and we'd like to, to, to show our guests that these are all semantics because rye whiskey based on the TTB in the United States has to be 51% rye, but in Canada, sure. it can have 1% rye. So these are, these are People sitting in offices deciding rules, and some of them do have experience with distilling and all the rest. I'm not saying that they're not involved, but um, they're not boots on the ground, if that makes sense. So right. um, it, we have to approach it with a very open mindset, you know, and then gin and rum, the umbrellas under those are so wide and far reaching that there's no set definitions. You can do and, so much. Um, but that said, you, uh, you got a chance to try this earlier, but um, now on your second tasting, it sips sweet, it's 80 proof, but it's not a Caribbean or an island style rum, right? Like, I mean, this yeah, is... Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you, you get some of those tropical notes, right? You get like a little bit of banana, you get some of the butterscotchy notes that you might expect from, uh, from a rum, um, but it's, it's got a, a clean nature to it that, that I, you know, if, if I had to like pick a, a rum style that, that might be closer to this, like a bar, a bar, Bados style where it's like where there's some of those stricter standards around what they like how they treat the rum it just it this reminds me of like how clean those can be but yeah you're right like most Jamaican styles or Guyanese like they're they're super funky and this is very light very approachable mm. well and we like it for that reason because um this is like clearly can take out on a boat fishing all day and do all right with right um whereas the dark rum which we're about to try yeah, that's nice. Far more of a fireside with a Cuba ice sipper. You know, if you're a cigar person, it's great to pair with a cigar. Um, and so the gold rum was in the uh, was in the, the rum. No, cup. actually, it was, so it was, it was we the used dark. dark rum. Yep, yep. Um, now here's the truth: gold rum's great, and it's great to build into cocktails. Um, you know, let me skip for a moment. Anyone who ever says, "Why would you use a gold or a dark rum in a cocktail that calls for a white rum?" Um, <laughs> Candidly, it's very simple. Old rums and dark rums have more complexity and more personality than white rums, so inherently your cocktail is going to have more complexity and personality. Right, it's going to um, be a different color. Yeah, but but, uh, but we barring, also know in, you know in the liquor industry, color means jack shit. So um, you know we uh, we can add a color with dye, we can charcoal filter it out. It's um, color is not going to be indicative of of anything matter of fact. But this dark rum. It's not barrel aged anymore, it's not spiced, and by parts per volume, it's actually got the same sugar content as the gold rum because we caramelize that sugar. Uh-oh, somebody's excited about something. Um, we caramelize that sugar and uh, add it back in, but we do it in such small volumes that it changes the flavor profile, it brings the funk of molasses back to the front end. Right but it doesn't end up sweetening it. Now it sips sweeter, which we loved explaining to guests, because people will pick up on like, it just, it sips, it tastes sweeter. It's your taste buds playing tricks on you because of that new flavor profile right on the front, that funkiness of the molasses the, that's replicated by yeah. the caramelized sugar. But we know that there's literally that much sugar difference between the gold rum and the dark rum that's, and that much in 10 gallons uh, dispersed of gold rum, so. Right, it, the size of a quarter you said. Exactly, yeah, and, and that much will affect the flavor profiles that drastically. Um, and it's, it all, it comes down to ratios. You gotta remember too, that every batch of gold rum is a little bit different. So we have to burn the sugar a little bit differently every time to try to maintain consistency with the dark rum. But this is now sipping more along the lines of a Caribbean style, a little more funk and that inherent vanilla caramel flavoring of molasses. It does, you get, definitely get more vanilla on this. And um, <clears throat> wow. Yeah, it's it's still dry though. It's it doesn't taste like I'm getting a mouthful of sugar. Right. It's not like we added the molasses directly back in or you know caramel. It's um, no. It, it's it's not what I would call a sweet rum, but it is a definitely a sipping rum. 
Yeah, I could see this. I could see that performing really well on a large rock. Are those proof wise the same? Yeah. So currently, um, for Blue Dyer Spirits, everything is bottled at 80 proof. Um, we did a single run in the tavern of some cash strength whiskey that was phenomenal and cannot wait till we can do that as, as a production bottling. Right. Um, but it's going to be a little bit of time. And for those who don't know, um, in the distilling industry, there's a lot of regulations and a lot of rules. Um, and whenever you bottle something at a different proof, it requires a new set of paperwork and approvals and labels and all the rest. And so as a young distillery without an accountant on staff, we have decided currently it's best to run everything at 80 proof. And part of the logic behind that too, is that it's a, it hits all the requirements for all the spirits that have to be at certain proofs, but it also makes it a great buildable spirit that doesn't get, send it anybody running away. If you've got a 95, 98 proof rum, not everyone can handle that. You know, yeah. some people want a 105 proof whiskey, but the people who want a 90 or an 85, like can't handle the burn of a 105. Like, you know, you, you, we get to hit every market with this. So it works. Right. And sometimes, especially I'll go to a rum distillery or any other kind of distillery really. And you, you, you'll get those little shots in those little, uh, thimble little style cups. cups. Yeah. For whatever reason, those things tend to focus the burn of those higher proof spirits in a way that you just take it and you're like, like even me, I think like I can handle, I can handle pretty much anything you throw at me as long as you're not like pouring, like holding my nose and pouring 151. Yeah. Uh, but like those, I've never, little, those little cups really focus. I've never it. been a fan, man. Like, and we, we use them at markets too. Like, you know, you don't have a choice. You can't take, right. you know, I'd love for every, everybody to have their own tasting cup or if I could just, you know, here, open your mouth. Let me, yeah. But, but I, something about the plastic, it coming off the plastic always seems to just, you know, it's like the same reason you want to drink your drinks out of glass and not metal or, or plastic typically is, you right. know, why would you want to taste them out of it either? But, um, sometimes we use what we have to use. Right. Um, so those, those rums are great. Uh, and, and so you started with rums and then did they, they kind of like migrate to some of the other so spirits? There's, there's some history of the brand where I was not with the brand at the time. Um, started with rum, then gin, um, and then whiskey, and then came back to dark rum or I, sorry, I believe barrel gin, and then dark rum. Somewhere along the lines, um, a port finish was done on the whiskey, um, and we're actually approaching the third release of that. Um, it's almost an homage to what Angel's Envy did. Um, Lincoln Henderson's phenomenal bourbon that was uh, dropped in uh, ruby port barrels, um, and we do a bourbon mash whiskey that is dropped in tawny port barrels. Now it's a far younger whiskey. It's not legally a bourbon because we use right. cherry wood in our process and it's a younger rest in the port barrels. So we don't, we don't make the comparison in any kind of publication to Angel's Envy, but out of respect to them, it, it really is a similar style. And every now and then we'll get customers will, who have heard of Angel's Envy will say, wow, this is, you know, on par or similar. Um, definitely clearly a younger spirit. You, you just no disputing that, but now, actually, we should try some, shouldn't we? Yeah, let's um, do that. And so, I, th I think it's like, I think it's really, uh, it's a courageous thing, especially like at the time when it came out, it was a very courageous thing to take your bourbon, take oh, the yeah. name bourbon off of it. They, they caught some heat for yeah, that. Yeah. yeah it's, and and it, it's, wow, it's such a contentious spirit because it's been so popular. I, I, I don't know if it's as popular as it was maybe two or three years ago, even. I think there are some other spirits that are kind of rising in the in the social consciousness, maybe, you know, Mezcal's and then some, and Amari and some other things, or maybe, you know, not not as popular as bourbon, but they've taken some of the wind out of the bourbon craze. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when that happened, when they took the word bourbon off the bottle in order to pursue something that based on, you might call them archaic regulations or overly stringent regulations. Uh, who am I to say? You can maybe take a guess on where I stand, but uh, you know, but they, they, they took the word off so that they could have more license to experiment. And I think that was a really courageous move and, and obviously a very delicious spirit. Well, I, I love um, explaining to people who, you know, when they, they're trying to understand whiskeys and it's, there's a lot of misconceptions and whiskey is a spirit category. Bourbon is another name for corn whiskey in the U.S., and there's some history to the word bourbon itself, but for all intents and purposes, it means corn whiskey. Uh, rye whiskey has to be 51% rye, wheat, et cetera, et cetera. To get the true name bourbon, we know that it has to be two years in charred American oak casks, um, and it can't be flavored with anything other than oak. Um, so our best example to guests trying to wrap their brains around this is Jack Daniels. 
because Jack Daniels is bourbon whiskey. However, legally, because they filter it through maple charcoal filters, uh, maple charcoal at the end of their process, it is now flavored with something other than oak. And so legally they can't call it bourbon whiskey and hence Tennessee whiskey is born. Now there's of course some history outside of that related to um, Old Crow and actually coming back to Lincoln Henderson and sour mash and that whole realm of thought. But the truth is that legally on its own before those other processes it was it was bourbon whiskey but because of those laws saying that it you know can't be flavored with anything other than oak it suddenly was outside that category and so then it the differentiation between those categories got broader and broader as time went on so with ours we have a one-year whiskey because we have a four-year distillery now we know we know that sourcing is an option um and any brands that use it and are upfront about it are great brands and they're not doing anything wrong um occasionally brands will not be as upfront as they could be but we all know that it's always listed on the label of the bottle so right um with us we choose to make things that we make ourselves from the beginning all the way to the end um and therefore we can't have at our disposal a five or six year whiskey right now um so we have a one-year whiskey now with that said oak takes a while to break down and so we're not getting the full breakdown in a year we chose to work with cherry wood in addition to the oak. We source cherry wood here in Maryland and we cut spindles and we char it. And hanging spindles is a, unfortunately, kind of scoffed upon technique in the in the traditional distilling world. However, it's becoming everly, increasingly more popular right. and accepted. And here's the truth. And when you say spindles, they're like these little spiral, yeah, uh, they look they're, like they're, uh, they're cores. They they're, look like shark or stingray yeah. eggs. And, and, and so with our cherry wood, they're actually straight sticks with oak and sassafras and some others. I see. They tend to be like little spirals, yeah. Um, but the, the thing is, you're exposing your spirit to wood tannins, whether they're charred or uncharred, regardless of whether it's in a barrel or not. Now, in our case, we're using a wood oak barrel, and then they're putting more wood inside of it. But there's there's an argument sometimes that if people use um, steel or plastic and then hang wood in it, that that's not, that's cheating. And, you know, look, if the product comes out good on the other end, it was still aged with wood, the plastic or the metal is is neutral. It's not affecting the liquor at all. Right. You know. Um, now we don't do that. We use wooden barrels. But if 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 damn it, man, if we if we were to take a plastic barrel down and put a bunch of gin in it and you know, drop some some cherry wood in it and do it, it did a cherry wood aged gin, like. It's not. It's not not cherry wood aged in. It's just, it just wasn't in a wooden barrel. You right. know. So the, the, some people get hung up on the details um, or the traditions, I should say. Um, and you don't want to be unsensitive to the traditions either. But our whiskey is 80% corn, 13% rye, 7% malted barley. So it's going to sip very warm and sweet and almost with a honeyed note because of that high corn mash. However, yeah. because we're not getting the very strong breakdown of tannins, it's going to swallow hot because it's a young whiskey. It it's, doesn't though, right? It's it's pr- it's pretty it's pretty remarkable for a one year whiskey in, in that um, like it's got that earthy nose. It's the nose is like I'm getting the rye on the nose quite a bit, and then it kind of swaps around. And on the palate, I get more of the corn. I get oh, that yeah. cherry wood influence for sure. And I, I, maybe it finishes hot. Well, but like it, not. It, it, here's the trick, Eric. What you're drinking doesn't. And sometimes I wish that we had a barrel that we didn't put the cherry wood into so we could do a side-by-side comparison. It doesn't finish hot because you get the cherry wood on the swallow. That's where it primarily shows up. Sure. Right exactly where the burn would typically be. And the best part about the cherry wood is it's not sweetened. You know, it's not sugar. And it's not the cherry flavor we're kind of indoctrinated into with lollipops and candies and the rest. It's true cherry wood flavor. The same that oak wood is true oak wood flavor. Um, and so we get the oakiness that you expect in a whiskey, but now we have some of the more mellow floral cherry flavor that you don't necessarily expect in a whiskey. Right. Um, and there's very few distilleries in the U.S. Uh, working with cherry wood. There are a few. There's about a half dozen last time we checked. Um, and there's a couple Scottish brands and a couple Japanese brands. We are definitely the only maryland brand working with cherry wood um and we do also happen to source the cherry wood here in maryland which i find some irony too because um cherry wood is is not native to maryland but <laughs> has has kind of become an almost an adopted plant for for dc and for maryland as, sure, you know ever right. since it showed up right. um but i'll tell you what i'm actually going to run away real quick because uh i have some of the port uh from batch two hidden in the office and uh 
we should try it. Should we not? Yeah, go ahead and get that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the videos while you're grabbing that. So we were able to get here nice and early. We had a good chat, caught up a little bit. And then Dan and I actually, uh, we recorded a cocktail video that we'll be launching in association with this podcast episode. So don't want to spoil it, but uh, it's a Martinez. Uh, it's a really cool take on the Martinez with some house made ingredients. So uh, if you're listening in, on this episode right now, uh, be sure to head over to our YouTube channel. Uh, really helps us out if you like the video. Maybe leave us a comment. Tell us we did a great job. Tell <coughs> tell Del Dan how how handsome he is and, and how uh, how good he's doing behind his bar. Uh, and then also subscribe to the channel because the sooner we hit a thousand subscribers, the sooner we can do great things like link back to our website and monetize our content so that I get paid something at some point. Yeah, somebody should pay this guy because uh, <laughs> I can't do it. Um, but what he's doing for the industry is absolutely phenomenal. Um, besides the line of bitters that he's been working on for years now um, and the work that he does uh, also with Element Shrubs, uh, Modern Bar Cart itself speaks for the industry. It gives other people in the industry an opportunity to have a voice. So we're going to do a little NPR pitch here and say that NPR loves you, but without your donations, NPR can't continue to exist. So Modern Bar Cart uh, does, does need you, um, so don't forget them. Well, shucks. Thanks, now, Dan. Now, in the meantime... Pay, I have, me, pay me in liquor. I was going to say, I have some port finished whiskey from Batch 2 for you, so we'll, we'll sip on that, and I think that should uh, at least alleviate momentarily until we sober up, right? Right. Um, so what this is, this is Batch number 2, um, so we'll have Batch number 3 coming out this year. Um, it's a limited release we do every year where we take some of our bourbon mash whiskey and we put it into tawny port barrels for three to four months. Um, this year we're going for a longer rest if possible. Um, we actually did uh, switch up our barrels. Um, technically it is not a Portuguese port wine this year. We got some um, dessert wine barrels made here in the United States. Um, and by all intents and purposes, it's a fortified dessert wine. But for, for our sake, you know, it turned out to be a better flavor profile. We wanted to work with it and we got an opportunity to, to get a hold of them without, you know, some of the headaches involved in the actual port barrels. Um, and there's always the, the sulfur question with, um, with port barrels, you right. know, especially because there are, some, there are some blind and also double blind aspects to barrel sourcing when it comes to confidentiality, what you can oh, put on yeah. the label and what you are actually told about the barrel you're using. So and, and, again, it's great to be able to use these things and people in the scotch, in, I mean, the scotch industry has, is basically erecting a palisade or a palisade wall around <laughs> these freaking barrel producers in, the, in, in Spain and Portugal because their you know, barrels are not easy to come by and they're integral to what scotch has been doing. So it's very difficult to weasel your way in and even get one or two of these things shipped over to the U.S. and then have the confidence to know that they were not treated with sulfur that's going to go in and rotten egg your your juice well and then even more importantly you know you buy five barrels and only three of them hold liquid that's right. it you're, Stave you're leak. stuck with the the other two you know so it's it's a gamble every time but it's a great aspect of the industry to use these barrels and keep them rotating and and get other uh rests that we are not necessarily used to getting you know port finished rests have become rather common now right um but not in a way that they're overdone there's still plenty to be done with them um is this a california grapes or from a different part of the country as far as the the, the uh, port the dessert wine so th as far as i know it was a tawny port um, and we actually had the barrels in here. We're actually tur we're turning the barrels from the last batch into bookshelves for our games. Oh, um, nice. Uh, it's coming along nicely, actually. Um, but I do not know anything about the grapes or um, the varietals involved because by the time those barrels came to us, again, like you said, minimal information. Um, those for batch two were also here in, on property, already being aged when I started working for the brand. So, gotcha. Um, well, it's it's delicious, and and you can you can kind of tell the difference between this and then the regular just cherry wood. And, like and it's going back to back apparent. is a nice way to do it because then you get to actually compare it. Yeah, um, you still get that earthy note on the nose, but I, I get you almost get like that sugar plum kind of the, it, the plumminess. It picks in the up fortified uh, wine sugars being in the barrel, so it's actually legitimately a bit sweeter than the other one, minutely. But fortified wine has sugar in it. Far, far higher content than a, a whiskey does. Um, but you're getting notes of plum, 
dark grape uh, and, and, you know, um, with that... I almost got like a grape leaf. There's like a slight little vegetal or... Um, I was going to say... Like ca- not capsaicin, but like a bell, like a leafy bell pepper. It, it's just like this little stripe in the background. It's not... It's barely noticeable, but I get like there's... Yeah, like grape. If you ever had like or, those stuffed or even, grape even leaves? almost like cumin. Like I'm, I'm picking up where you're like on the top of the roof of your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Something else we get from folks, who, um, especially when we have it to pour out, is they'll say that it sips a lot like a cognac. And they're not wrong. I like that comparison, and here's why. First of all, you and I both know the taste is subjective. You're the only one in your own mouth. So anytime somebody says it tastes like this, sure, it absolutely does to them, and they're not wrong. Other people may taste different things. Right. Um, so I'll never say this is just like a cognac. But to say that it sips like a cognac is actually not wrong, and here's why. A cognac is a grape-distilled spirit that's barrel-aged. This is a grain-distilled spirit that's barrel-aged and then rested in a fortified grape wine barrel. So it's going to pick up very similar properties. And again, still be different, but uh, we don't mind the comparison. Well, and it's... It's funny too because, uh, like, being a part of the the spirits judging community now, I get to, you know, sit in and soak up the the wisdom of people who have been working in a specific category for for decades. And it was interesting to to hear people talking about brandies in, in the context of distilling grapes is very difficult, and it has some unique flavor problems that distilling other things don't have. And I think it's funny that you're it, it, like when you when you work with something whether it's a fortified wine or a brandy of some sort like there's this grapiness that's unmistakable once you once you learn how to identify the grapiness it doesn't matter if it was like a fortified wine barrel that was that you rested a whiskey in or if it's an actual brandy that's then treated in a way that brandy isn't usually treated there's this this grapey through line which is why i was like god damn i taste grape leaves in here like it's all like there's like the character of the grape is so pervasive and and very interesting you know in my opinion i, I like the flavor but it, it, it is unmistakable and i really like trying to pick up on it when i can even when it's just a, a barrel finish or something like that do we have enough in us to do the gins? Let's do, uh, why don't we, why don't you take us through the, the regular gin, let's taste the barrel. Okay. Just yeah. like talk yeah, us through the botanicals. Yep. So um, with our dry gin, we, uh, we do a very simple martini gin. Now it is a dry style martini gin, but not overly dry, nor is it overly juniper. And so there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, essentially, we have two spectrums of gin, right? Uh, we can, of course, complicate the heck out of it, but for argument's sake, uh, we have botanically forward, and we have traditional London-style dry uh, with a heavy juniper aspect. Now, we could get into talking about Plymouth gin. We could get into talking about, you know, they, 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 there's old Tom, and we're going to get to the barrel, of course. But um, There's young Tom. There's oh, Tom the Third. Oh, see, young I've heard of. Tom the Third, you're going to have to teach me. But um, No, that was a joke. Oh, <sighs> but see, now now somebody's going to make Tom the Third. Well, um, by Blue Dyer Distilling Company. Right? Um, there's... Okay, too many tangents. We'll 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 come back. Um, for our dry gin, super simple maceration: lemon peel, coriander, juniper. Now, you're rarely going to find gins with less than five botanicals. But here's the nuance to this gin: those who work with spirits, who make bitters, um, who make gins, know that when you have less botanicals, you have a higher chance of one of those botanicals overpowering the others in the spirit. So when you have five, six botanicals, they blend together a little bit better. It's not to say that it's easier. I'm not at all implying that, Um, but it is a higher likelihood that your blend will work together without any single botanical overpowering the others. But you only have three and you don't hit the ratios just right, something's gonna overpower something else and it's gonna be too dominantly lemon or too dominantly coriander. So the uniqueness of the spirit is not only that it's uh, clean, crisp, and refreshing, and it's a nice middle ground gin that's not botanically forward and it's not heavy on the juniper. So people can kind of meet right in the middle on it, but it is also balanced and not overpowering in any of those one areas. So we love this gin as kind of an introductory gin uh, to folks who aren't terribly into gin, but it's also middle ground. If like you say, I, I drink nothing but Hendrix and Monkey 47, and somebody else is like, well, I drink nothing but Tanqueray, so we're not gonna get along. Um, <laughs> those two people can sit down and drink 
our dry gin, and both of them will be pretty appeased at the fact that it's not too botanically forward for the tank guy, but it's not too juniper heavy or cardamom heavy for the uh, Hendrix guy. Sure. So um, what we do with that and what we've got in our hands now is uh, actually our barrel rested gin. And so there's a really fun history with barrel rested gin. Um, and there's different stories, again, as is always the case. Um, it's lovely. The important part is that on the front end, You've got notes of the uh, barrel-aged oak spirit and corn spirit, uh, sorry, or grain spirit. And on the back end, still very much gin. But what's fun for us is that this used to be something that was kind of an accident, wasn't necessarily done intentionally, and now in modern times, distillers are doing it intentionally. Um, this is our dry gin dropped into our whiskey barrels for a couple months. So picks up color, but we talked about color it is inherently meaningless. Um, it's cool to look at, but doesn't imply anything, at least, it, suge it suggests it's suggestive. things, yeah. but, it, but it doesn't, yeah. But what's important is it's picking up charred oak, charred cherry wood, corn, rye, and malted barley, which are flavors that are not inherent to gins traditionally. And so right. legally, <clears throat> again, TTB, still gin. But for all intents and purposes, is a completely different spirit. And if we drop that gin in a rum barrel, uh, it would be as different from the, str the traditional dry as the whiskey is. Uh, sorry, as the bar whiskey barrel is. So the uniqueness for which you can create gins these days is as wide as the uniqueness of all the other spirits that are exist out there. If, if it goes into a barrel, you can toss gin into it after sure. you empty it out. Right. So we can do wine, we can do beer, we can do rum and mezcal. Um, gins can be finished many different ways. And then, and then they can be sweetened too, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing. So if you want to get into old Tom, we can do that, but that might be a whole separate podcast. Yeah, I think old Thomas needs, uh, needs his own episode. I agree. Uh, but, yeah. but yeah, this is lovely. And, uh, you know, it, it does, it almost reminds me like of a, a Geneva in, in that it's picking up some of the, the right. grain characteristics um, and Geneva is really hot right now. So um, yeah, this is, this is really good. And I think, you know, for the cocktail application that we're t uh, pairing up with this podcast episode that the Martinez just like, it's perfect, right? It's just absolutely it's like perfect. missing wing cocktail, man. Absolutely. Uh -huh. um, so those were awesome spirits. Uh, Thank you for sharing them with us. Um, let me just, I want to talk a little bit about like your social media stuff and then we can hit a couple lightning round questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and actually just taking one step back, if, if you don't mind, because you had asked me a, kind of a two part question on this and I, I we got distracted talking spirits, which there's no, nothing wrong with. Um, officially here with Blue Dyer, um, this is all stuff that I have learned being a part of the brand as I get to know the spirits that we are creating and working with. It's still an area that I'm very much growing in um, when it comes to doing the tours, for example. Sure. I love talking spirits and cocktails. And then uh, every now and then when somebody asks me a technical question, I'll be like, well, my friend, that's a very good question. Uh, if you look up at the barrels up at the top right there while I Google the answer to your question, I, you know, um, because I just I don't always know. Um, and my, I don't want to say expertise, but my heavier, uh, more proficient area of knowledge is definitely in the mixing and imbibing side. Sure. Um, and so that's actually what I do here. Um, I was kind of doing a little bit of everything and that's when you and I met, um, and I was doing some consulting for a number of different brands and I was doing some brand ambassador work for a couple of different brands as well. And I hitched on with Blue Dyer and we kind of developed a rapport and for about the better part of seven months I was consulting um, and I, I helped set up this tavern program and, and continued to work off-site events for them. Um, but sometime in June, uh, a number of things changed both in my life and in the Blue Dyer business model uh, and a position was offered to me to come down and, and take over as a beverage director for the program, both on-site and off-site. Um, so now anytime we do markets or festivals uh, where we do pop-up bars, that is under my, you know, directorship, so to speak. It's a nice pumped up title, but uh, basically means I design it, I train any staff involved, uh, I implement it um, in terms of the cocktail program itself. If it's part of the tavern, it's it's under my 
regime of responsibility, so to speak. But we all wear a number of hats here. Um, you know, the Walker and Ryan, they wear about six or seven different hats at any given time. Ryan is literally physically building our food truck while still keeping production up in the back. Walker is hands down taking care of all of our sales through Maryland, Delaware, and DC, um, while also working with me on marketing. And, and you know, it's, so we, we definitely have our crossovers. Um, but for me, my role here is to create a successful tavern program that can showcase what we're making, educate our clientele, um, and expand their, their horizons, while at the same time generating revenue for the distillery program so that we can get more things into barrel right. uh, and then ideally have more bottles out to the public in a couple of years, you know? And, and so it's all, uh, everybody's scratching everybody else's back. You know, everything is reliant on everything else. Our food truck is fuel for our tavern and our tavern is fuel for our distillery. And, you know, it's all circular, but we also work with local breweries and we work with other distilleries and we're, you know, I, I am, Ironically, uh, you, you know a little bit about this. I, uh, Brooke Brown and I, she's a Southern Maryland bartender, very skilled, um, runs a lot of her own classes and programs. She and I last, early this past year, put a proposal together for the Spirit Skilled and, and we do a Maryland cocktail menu program with them. And as part of that, we got affiliate memberships with the guild. Um, and then as I came to work at Blue Dyer, we're also members of the guild. So now I'm a double member of the Maryland Distillers Guild. Look but, at you. But yeah, because you get a whole lot of perks for being a double member. <laughs> um, so uh, skipping, skipping back ahead now to, I guess, wherever we left off. Um, where did we leave off? Eric? Social media, man. Like, yeah, you, that's you right. Kill it. You oh, kill it. Oh, I run the social media for Blue Dyer. Did I mention that too? Yeah. So, so yes. Um, you know, like I said, we all wear, wear many hats, and um, we talked about that photojournalism background. I started with film, and then actually moved into early digital back when we were using uh, digital rebels. You know, like the T ones and T twos. Oh yeah. Um, and so for me, I learned a lot of this early on, conceptually. But the actual technology has changed so much. The algorithms for the social media have changed so much. You know, when we first started this all, I said we, I said, you know, when Facebook was starting, businesses were barely on board with it as a right. concept. Now you cannot run a business without an active social media. You can, but let's be realistic, it's difficult. So with the speakeasy model of business. Yeah, to not just run silence and hope people find it, yeah. So for, for that angle, man, I, <laughs> I appreciate it. It means a lot that, that people are noticing and that it looks professional um, because while I try to maintain professionalism, while I try to maintain kind of, you know, consistency with what we're doing, because those algorithms change every day, because people's trends change every other week, because, you know, our program is so in flux right now, it's, it's a little bit difficult to find that consistency. I've actually got somebody new to our program right now who did some marketing work for the Army, but has not done much, yeah, but has not done much for... I, I get, I gotta pause. I get that that's a thing, but I'm thinking of this as, as like, complete, like, like going out and, and uh, like, in, Instagramming, like, uh, like, like... I don't know, like helicopters and yeah, it's think, <laughs> think, think, think military propaganda combined with like you know, uh, and uh, what is it, NWO? Like, I mean, it's there's a combination of things going on with it. But he's got a lot of potential, a lot of intelligence, a lot of proactive drive, and so he hasn't been on Facebook or Instagram in a while. But he is coming in to work with me and and get back into the swing of things. He already took over our Mailchimp and has drafted a number of, of auto responses and, and welcome letters and things like that. And it's, it's perfectly in line with our business model. Awesome. And I, we, we reviewed them the other day and we were like, dude, this is amazing. We love the proactive you know, uh, energy you're putting into this. This is, this is why you belong here. So we're finding people that have skill sets that are applicable to what we need without having too many cooks in the kitchen. And, and that's the goal of any business. Sure. Um, and so uh, it, Ideally, one day, I would like to say that the, the, the social media will get turned over to that particular person and I can move back to focusing on the bar program. But um, I do like the social media. I have no nothing against it. It's just it takes so much time. It takes so much energy. It does. It does. And you're, um, a perf you're a perfectionist. 
Yeah, I have my moments. Um, I was, I will say I was pretty proud of that um, Element Shrub, DC and Bitterman, Angel's Envy build that we did uh, the other day. Yeah, how long um, did it take you to get these garnish wings? Oh, only about eight minutes, seven, eight minutes. I mean, Jeez. like I was ha holding a conversation with a couple of guests here in the bar while I was cutting the wings. And, and the only reason it took me that long to cut them was because I was kind of trying to figure out like, how do I, what, what shape is going to look aesthetically pleasing? Um, I'm not like a, you know, we're all artists in our own respect, but like when it comes to actually drawing and that kind of thing, I am terrible. So I do not doubt that there are a number of people out there that could create far better angel wings with an orange garnish. I mean, I've, you know, I've seen, I mean, who doesn't just do that once or twice a week? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, right. I'm going to go home and make some angel swings out of a, I, I an think, orange peel I, tonight. I think anybody making old fashions with angels envy, whether it's the rye or the bourbon should absolutely be making angels wings with their citrus. But you know, that's uh, not for me to say, I guess, um, we have to get uh, Tony Burke to chime in on that one. But for, for me, that was a, Thing that I was passionate about, which is why I did the wings the way I did, because here's the thing, I, I have a lot of respect for Angel's Envy, and I know some of the people who work with them, um, and I respect the work that they do. I know Element Shrubs and Charlie, and I know you and your products with your bitters, and so for me, when I was thinking about that build, I knew I wanted to build in, because Charlie started doing a shrub for a shrub, and Angel's Envy does um, Toast to the Trees, so I wanted to build a drink for that. And then I thought about it, I was like, I need bitters to build this old fashioned, what are my options? And I, I want you to know, I didn't pick your bitters based on, I wanted to work with your bitters. I picked your bitters because you had a bitters that I thought would work very well with this build. Sure. And the sarsaparilla bitters were absolutely idyllic to go with the rye whiskey and the chai parish, or sorry, we did the blood orange saffron on that one, because right. um, I played with both. And, and they just it just came together beautifully in an old-fashioned build that got its sugar, it got its citrus, uh, it's got its bitters, but it's built on a rye that's finished in a Caribbean rum. Okay, there's just so much flavor going on building on each other. Right. Um, so for me, if I'm going to build a drink like that, the garnish should match. Right, you know? yeah. So it, it didn't seem out of the ordinary. Now, I learned... Maybe a year or two ago, because um, we're slightly older, we're we're not we're not young chickens. I've got a, chickens. I've got a hip replacement coming up. There you go. Okay, I've had two knee surgeries. So the point the point is that um, some of these newer, newfangled terms and words people are using. Somebody called me extra, and I was like, I'm sorry. What does that mean? Um, and now I full now I fully am aware. But at the time, I was like, what 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 are you trying to say about me? And they you know kind of described, and I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm extra. That's I'll own it. That's fine. Because Sometimes you got to be a little bit extra about things, you know, like, another word would be passion or enthusiasm, but you right. know, so I definitely know that I rub people the wrong way with my extraness from time to time. And you know what? I can't please everyone. So it's just at this point in life, like if I'm too extra for you, then maybe we won't work together. It turns out I was the right amount of extra for Blue Dyer Distilling Company. So you're the right extra. Right amount of extra for me, Dan Marlowe. And uh, you can pick up the sarsaparilla bitters and the blood orange saffron shrub over at modernbarcart.com. You like that plug? Shameless plug. There we um, go. But let's do some lightning round questions, yeah? Yeah, can do. What's your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite cocktail of all time, what's something you've been obsessed with recently? Yeah, absolutely. So hands down, it's going to be the flip. And we kind of touched that on that uh, earlier. Yeah. Um, That's a weird choice. Not weird, but it's atypical. You know, you know what's funny? In the uh, DC Craft Bar Guild, they do a shameless, uh, or sorry, a guilty pleasure drink where for new members, they say you have to name your, and they're expecting things like, you know, a vodka crayon or a, a you know, a Jaeger, Jaeger and Red Bull. Like, um, and so every now and then people will say something like, um, Corpse Survivor number four or, or this and, and everybody's like boo that's not a shameless cock you know um, and, and I was one of the dumbasses my first time where I was like I like a maple gin flip and they're like no no that's not a guilty pleasure that's like a bougie high end you know I'm like whatever that's my guilty pleasure like when I'm feeling kind of sad and lonely like or like just reminiscent and need something sweet and creamy to sip on like that's the drink I'm gonna make for myself but I think for me it's it's also just very nostalgic because we talked earlier about how that was the first cocktail I ever made that was really breaking the mold of everything else was something I had been taught it was like on the menu or like we were doing it and I got shown how to make it and that was it. I had never gone and learned a new cocktail myself until that point. And it was because, um, you know, my boss it kind of pushed me towards it and I was, I'm very appreciative that um, he did that for me. And I, you know, we, he and I actually reconnected recently because he now works for Verano Brands and Zenleaf, which is a 
booming industry if nobody's aware that's that is the medicinal and recreational marijuana industry and we had a chat and I, I, I let him know that that was the push going on three years ago now that was the push where he asked me to, to make that different drink and ever since um, so um, the uh, Guilty pleasure drink is established, um, but for categories of drinks, um, I've been very obsessed with old fashions lately, and the reason for that is quite simply that we know that the drink itself is a category of drink. It's not specifically inherent uh, to whiskey, um, and it actually started with gin. And so introducing that to our guests, and so when they order an old fashioned, we always look at them and say, would you like that with rum, whiskey, or gin, smoked or unsmoked? And so most people will turn to us and say, really, tell me more, because I'm used to it. Sure. And we love broadening people's horizons. And so for that reason, um, I've, I've been very obsessed with that. And we're not currently working with eggs in this program because of the health code. And actually, so we use aquafaba for our egg whites, but I don't have the whole eggs to be able to do flips with. Um, so guilty pleasure on my own. But as far as our program's concerned, old fashions have been the drive and direction. Um, so what do we got next for lightning? Very nice. Uh, cocktail ingredient. If you were a cocktail ingredient, what would you be? But up, up. So I was reading this the other night and it just popped in my, you know, when you have like the light bulb and it's like, right. no hesitation, lightning round, maple syrup, like hands down. And there's a reason for this. And, and um, regardless of, of what experiences we have in life, you just kind of end up realizing who and what you are as you get older. Um, there's different types of sugars. And you know this, you know, saccharides in general, they can come from a lot of different sources. Um, so we have fruit sugars, and then we have cane sugars, we have date sugars, and we have beet sugars. We have sugars that come from honey, we have sugars that come from maple. Um, and all these different sugars, while they're all sweet and molecularly have very similar properties, they have different taste profiles inherent to how they were grown, raised, processed, etc. And I mentioned earlier, I like earthy. I like, you know, smoky and terra and kind of, you know, a little bit malty. And so when it comes to sugars, honey is very botanical. Date is very sweet. Beet is kind of almost... Beet sugars are hard to describe because fully processed, they're almost the same as cane sugar. Right, um, very similar. But there's still kind of almost a more vegetable aspect to them. And then when it comes to cane sugars, oh my God, we have demerara and turbinado oh, yeah. and and muscovado and you know there's so many ways to process those sugars um, that there's lots of different styles that come out of it. But maple is exactly what I look for. It's earthy. It's warm, sweet, but not as heavy and slow as a molasses. Right. Um, so with, for me, I can work with a maple in a light spirit. I can work with it in a dark spirit. I can work with maple with some cream and some soda water and do a maple cream soda that has no alcohol in it and is absolutely delicious. And then I can put it on my chicken and waffles and, you know, whatever else. But, but maple syrup is hands down um, my, yeah, that's... We've been we've been getting some really good answers to this question, <laughs> and this is one of them. That, that was fantastic. Um, cocktail with anybody past or present? Who'd it be? Where would you go? What yeah, would you yeah. have? Paint so us a picture. You, you did that. Well, you did that one to me, man. And then I I, I thought I was going to get caught up on it, um, and I realized that if if I overthought it, that I would. Um, so it's really simple, man. I would just want to sit and drink whiskey with Teddy Roosevelt, preferably towards the end of his life, maybe the last six or seven years, so that you know we have some more to discuss because I can't really talk about how he overcame his asthma if he still is 12 years old with sure. his asthma. You know, like, he also can't drink with him as, as confidently. Yeah, true, true. Most 12 um, year olds can't hold their liquor. Well, back in his time period, they could. Probably. Um, but touche. Um, no, you know, I, I mentioned that my dad was a history nut. He was a history major as well. And so he was very much into post 15th century history, whereas I have kind of focused more on pre 15th century history. Um, and I say he's post 15th, he's, he was really into um, 18th, 19th and 20th century history. And so when it came to civil war, post civil war, um, Spanish American war, uh, all the rest that that was his niche. And so that's kind of what I was around growing up and the museums we went to were kind of focused on those exhibits. And um, I learned a lot about Teddy Roosevelt and we have a lot of characters from the past that we can take um, inspiration from but for me somebody who was basically told from a young age that they would never 
be anything or do anything or be able to even go outside because they were, you know, struggling with such an ailment that at that time period there was nothing to be done about. And his father put him in a room with, with weights and and said, don't come out till you, you can, you know, and he, he literally just worked out, worked through his asthma as an adolescent and, and then came to be one of our most renowned leaders because of his gumption, because of his, frankly, brass balls. And, you know, like there's, there's always the hidden politics and, the, you know, you can, historians can get deep into this till they're blue in the face. But the truth is you want to talk about an American man because we'll, we, I got pride for a lot of different ethnicities, cultures and all the rest. And actually my American pride is somewhat waning on certain days of the week. Um, but two, two people to look up to, one, one, one is somewhat fictional, but, uh, would, would, would be Ron Swanson and then, <laughs> and then Teddy Roosevelt. You want to, you're not going to find two more manly men than that. And actually Nick Offerman is himself quite a, quite a representative of a manly man. And he followed me once on Instagram. It was uh, kind of, I, I might've lost my shit for like a day and a half, fully aware that it was probably an auto follow and that he was probably going to unfollow a few days later. I, I didn't care. It didn't matter. And he's a, he's a whiskey man himself. He's, exactly. he's, he's launching something with Lagavulin, I believe. He's, yeah. he's releasing a, a project with them. And I'm, a, I'm very excited to try to get a hold of a bottle of that. But he also does some incredibly impressive woodwork and, and has his own woodworking company um, as well. And, you know, so we're, we're digressing very different spectrums of, of people. But, um, yeah, I, I, it would be Teddy Roosevelt. Whiskey with Teddy. Uh, any books that are particularly <laughs> influential to you? Uh, there's obviously going to be a lot, but like a couple that stand out. Yeah, of course. Um, and so there are quite a few and especially some more recent ones, but um, I'm going to take it back a little bit. We, we've touched many times today on history and my appreciation of it. Um, to be a nonfiction reader takes a certain personality. Not everyone is is just how we are these days. You know, if there's not... A fictional aspect to it it's difficult to sometimes get involved and that's actually why i like historic fiction quite a bit because you can take sure. a character that may or may not have existed put them into real history and um but on the non-fiction front hg wells wrote something um and people are more used to his writings in the fictional theater um but he wrote something called the outline of history it's a two volume book that is literally the history of the world from the big bang all the way up to at his point in time you know his modern era and and that writing style showed me very early on that I like learning about how and why we are the way we are, whether it's bio biology, civilization, society. Um, and so building on that and getting closer to the cocktail world, there are two phenomenal books. Um, one is uh, the, I'm sorry, is, is a book called Salt by Mark Kolansky. And another one is um, History of the World in Six Glasses by Tom Sandage. And uh -huh. um, Salt is a, literally a, a parable history of society and civilization as told by salt and, and using it as a currency as well as a, a, a source of, of food preservation and, and the things that were uh, Spanish hams and sauerkrauts and all the rest and how those came to be and, and it's all because of salt. Um, and history of the world in six classes is just phenomenal. Um, it takes us through beer, wine, and distilled spirits and where your mind expects you to continue going with alcohol, it actually transitions uh, to uh, tea, coffee, and Coca-Cola because at that point, you're halfway through the book. You 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 have a grasp for how this is being presented to you, um, and suddenly you're like, "Wow, yeah, tea was a freaking empire. Coffee was a freaking empire. Coca-Cola globalization in 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 Africa and the Middle East and Asia was was and South America was a freaking empire, um, and it's all based on caffeine and alcohol." Um, so, we could talk books all day, but those yeah, are that's fascinating. I'd I'd love to read that. Um, uh, last advice you think, uh, any advice to, to anybody who, who might be interested in um, either becoming a better home bartender or even maybe stepping behind the stick in a professional sense, um, oh. what can you recommend? Um, so I've thought about this. I've, I've, had, I've had the experience to learn the wrong way. Um, I actually went to a bartending academy years ago so I could get that foot in the door. And I, and I learned that I got the paper and now I can go to a bar and now I can throw out everything that they just taught me and learn it for real because unfortunately the American bartending academies are not terribly, they're still teaching TGI Friday's cocktails, they're still teaching, you know. So um, what I would say is 
learn the history, and then riff. It's all well and good to riff a drink, to make something that is your own, to make something that is unique for your customers or your environment. But if you can't then explain the history of the drink to either yourself, your coworkers, or your clients, you have no business riffing the drink. And, it's and not going to resonate because it's not connected to anything. It's exactly. not like you're, you're, you're plucking a chord that's not in relation to anything else that's been said. It's like, it's, like it's like when somebody like just like appears in your conversation and tries to like, like but you're like, what do, what do you, why are you here? Well, it's, it's like when somebody tries to write a song without learning basic chords, you know, like you, you have, yep, mm. we got some auto dealerships here. Nice. Um, you know, you can't you can't write that song without learning how to play the instrument first. Sure. Um, and so, touching on that, my last my last thought was to respect the story. You know, because if you learn the history and then you riff, you're respecting the story of the drink that we talked about before. If you don't do that, then all you're doing is is throwing together sugar and spirits and calling it a day. It's it's you're back to bartending rather than barkeeping. Right. So. Um, you got to find your own path, but take it seriously. Don't don't half-ass it. Yeah, uh, Dan, how can how can people get in touch with you on social media and, and follow Blue Dyer? Yeah. Um, so for myself personally, um, as we mentioned, I, I'm I'm at fractions of zero, which uh, I've been astounded has been difficult for people to figure out. Sometimes it's quite literally just the word fractions of zero, which is an impossible. It's not. It's not even technically an equation. We could. I'm not a mathematician, but I. I we could I think they call them mathmographers they sure that's yeah. yeah um one way or another it's an unreal solution um so if you want to play with that one and get back to me feel free again some social commentary uh as far as blue dyer is going uh concerned we are on instagram at blue dyer distilling co is the at handle and then our hashtag is going to be blue dyer distilling we go ahead and drop the co just to keep it simple um and then we actually have a new hashtag now uh for blue dyer tavern so if anybody has any experiences where uh they get to try any of our cocktails or they come into our tavern and they want to post anything uh we would love to see that hashtag grow as well i don't want to bog anybody down but we also have a food truck that will be opening next month uh that is chuck wagon catering dmv um at the same handle and hashtag uh chuck wagon catering dmv there's not much to see there right now um because we are still finishing up production uh of the physical food truck but the menu has already been implemented um we're going to be running tex-mex down here in southern maryland to uh go with our rum whiskey and gin and we'll also be servicing the brewery up the street patuxent brewing which has been putting out some phenomenal beers so for those beer folks out there patuxent brewing first brewery in charles county and man davy can brew uh so keep an eye on them awesome well, Dan, thanks so much for having this conversation. Thank you for the killer rum and coke with the the passion the passion flower infusion, and uh, thank you for for taking us through, uh, through these beautiful spirits. I do encourage our listeners who are able to travel uh, in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area to to head on over and uh, visit us here at Blue Dyer Distilling Company. Whenever you get the chance, uh, definitely check the tavern hours. Make sure you can come in, not only just sample the spirits, but also like sit down, talk to Dan, have a drink. He is a real person. I'm, I'm sitting with him right now. And, uh, and he's also great on Instagram. So smash that follow button. <laughs> Dan's been awesome. Cheers, Eric. Pleasure. Looking forward to the next time. Cheers. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. 
Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners, and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember, folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, Spirits and Cocktail Insights by Dan Marlowe and Blue Dyer Distilling Company, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2019.